Good evening and welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs. Thank you for joining us for tonight's public conversation with Michelle Ree, founder and CEO of Students First. At this time, I want to take a moment to thank the Kansas City Federation of Teachers and school-related, I like the way you had that hyphen thing going, school-related personnel, Local 691. You guys have turned out to be one of the best marketing partners we've ever had. <laughs> you know how to bring out a crowd. I'm very impressed. Um, you even used the correct RSVP link. You know, we have some partners we've known for years that don't know how to do that. So I think we need to enlist some teachers to teach some other organizations how to do this right. I really uh, hope, as does uh, my dear friend and esteemed colleague, Crosby Camber III, we really do hope that this is the beginning of a new relationship. So please seek us out at the conclusion of this presentation and um, tell us about some other people with whom you have issues. We'll be happy to invite them to the library as well. <laughs> Actually, all levity aside, um, your library is all about diversity, most especially diversity of opinion. We always welcome the opportunity to work with outside groups to bring in speakers from across the political spectrum. And to that end, we would be very happy to work with the union uh, to bring in someone who you think may have a somewhat different viewpoint than tonight's guest. Speaking of tonight's program, I also want to thank the Show Me Institute for orchestrating Michelle Ree's visit to Kansas City. You know, Michelle Ree became something of a household name in the later years of the first decade of the 21st century when she served as chancellor of the Washington, D.C. public schools. Her experiences there, as well as the life she led leading up to that position, and her approach to public education is encapsulated in her new book, Radical, Fighting to Put Students First. To discuss the various themes in this book, she will engage in a public conversation conducted by Library Director Crosby Kemper III. Following the formal part of this program, Michelle will take a few questions from the audience. As I say at every single one of these events, you can check the tapes of the previous events if you don't believe me. I do want to emphasize the word question. In other words, no speeches, no diatribes, no disquisitions on your pet theories about how Crosby Kemper is an agent of the Illuminati. <laughs> Just a question, ideally in three or four sentences or less. Your fellow audience members will appreciate it, and the rest of us will too. I will say that there will be two library employees holding microphones at the bottom of these two aisles. Um, please stand in line, and we invite you to take your turn. If anyone disregards my request to simply ask a question, these two individuals have been instructed to use their own judgment about when to pull away the microphones. Now, while I love seeing displays of initiative on the part of members of my department, I would prefer that they did not have that opportunity tonight. I appreciate your cooperation. Radical, fighting to put students first, is for sale courtesy of our friends at Reading Reptile. Following the question and answer period, Michelle Ree will be signing copies up here on this stage with the line beginning over there on part of the auditorium I call the North Esplanade. Um, this is a signing line. It's for book sales. So only people who are carrying a copy of Michelle's book will be allowed onto the stage. OK, it is time for the main event. Please welcome Crosby Camper III and Michelle Reed. Good, we on? Good, thanks. Um, Michelle, if I may, um, 
I'd like to start tonight, uh, as I want to do, with a librarian story uh, uh, from uh, your story, actually, from your first teaching assignment uh, uh, for Teach for America uh, as a teacher assigned to a school called Har Harlem Park in Baltimore. Uh, a librarian, you've said, taught you a key lesson. You remember that? Yes. Um, so I had an extraordinarily difficult first year as a teacher, as I think many teachers do, uh, and um, was getting incredibly discouraged because I was, you know, in there every day. I was working hard, was trying to bring interesting lessons to the kids, and uh, much of the days ended up in in utter chaos. And I was beginning to sort of wonder what was going on, and you know, I mean, why weren't the kids sort of, you know, doing what I needed them to do? Um, and uh, it was, it got to the point where um, I uh, one day was called down to a meeting uh, for a special education meeting for one of my students. And so it was kind of a, a much needed reprieve at the, at the time. So I went down for this hour long meeting. Um, and as I was getting my things together to leave the room, uh, the principal had sent up the librarian. Uh, to cover my class and I said, you know, before I go down, I just want you to know my class is, is really tough and she's like, yeah, I'm good, I got it. And I said, no, I don't think you understand. I mean, they're really, you know, they're, they're, they're a handful and she said, they'll be fine. Uh, so I left thinking, oh, this poor woman, she has no idea what she's getting herself into. Um, as I came, was coming up from the meeting, I wasn't hearing the normal sort of uh, noise from my classroom and I walked in the room and I see the librarian sitting at the front of the classroom, kind of looking through my lesson plans and some other things, and the kids were all silent, kind of working on the you know, things that she had given them. And I thought, I've never seen them like this before. So she, I, I said, how were they? And she said, they were great. So she gets up and she gathers her things and she's walking out the door and she literally had not even crossed the door jam yet when the kids started up again. And they're, you know, <laughs> screaming and yelling and throwing things at each other. And I find them just, wait a second. So I'm, you know, yelling at the top of my list. Wait a second. I said, why is it that you can behave for her and you can't do that for me? And uh, one of my biggest troublemakers, this young man, said to me, it's because she knows what she's doing. <laughs> and it was a, a, a wake-up call uh, in a very significant way for me as a teacher because oftentimes when you're having trouble in the classroom, you begin to say, well, well the kids don't appreciate it, the, you know, they're having trouble. And, and that was a wake-up call to me that you know, the adults and what we're doing in the classroom every day with the children has a huge impact on, on you know, what they're able to do. Well, I, of course, I think what, for me, one of the lessons here that I impart to all the teachers, uh, to uh, parents and students in the audience is you can always turn to your librarian um, but, Michelle, uh, I, I want to I come back in the conversation, obviously, to, to, to what you learned as a teacher, because I think that's profoundly influenced what you've done as a superintendent, what you've done in, 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 the, in your organizations uh, and nationally and, and, your, and your agenda nationally. But I also, I think the, the audience would like to know uh, where, where this came from, where you came from uh, in the world. You're, you had a family that had, had teachers. Uh, you, uh, but, but where did your own uh, uh, background le lead you to this? So I, I come from teachers. My um, grandfather on my father's side um, was a very well-known teacher and then ultimately became a principal. Um, my grandmother on my mother's side, um, about five of my aunts, um, my best friend, my sister-in-law. So I, I, I have always been surrounded my entire life by teachers and I think it's because of that that I've always had an incredible appreciation for how difficult uh, the teaching profession is and how difficult doing that job well is every single day. And um, so I, I, I grew up in a, in, in a small town in Toledo, Ohio, um, and I grew up uh, in a very um, sort of privileged uh, household. Um, and my father um, always used to tell us when we were young, 
you know, what you have and what you've been able to do has absolutely nothing to do with kind of, you know, the fact that you're smarter or more talented or better than anybody else. It's because you were lucky enough to be born into this family and you have lots of resources and lots of support, et cetera. And the kids who are living in inner city Toledo um, are, are not any less talented or anything other than you. Uh, what the, the difference is that they live in a very different environment. And so he instilled in us the um, real need to be very community service oriented and focused and always to be kind of looking out for the underdog. Um, and so when I um, went to high school, I had the opportunity to uh, volunteer in an inner city classroom. My high school boyfriend's mother was a teacher in the inner city. Um, I wanted to sort of see what that was like. I, 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 you know, went in frequently with her and just saw the incredible challenges that she faced every day and juxtaposed that with the environment that I went to every day uh, in school and said, you know what, this is this, this is something that we have to be able to solve. Even back then when I was you know, just a teenager, um, the, the inequality and the inequities that existed was something that was very stark to me and something that I felt was unfair and unjust and something that needed to be fixed. And, and uh, you, you, you make it to college and, and you're not sure what you're gonna do. You've had your, your radical feminist phase as you talk about in your, in your book. And, and, uh, uh, and, but when you graduate, you choose TFA yeah. uh, to, to Teach for America uh, to go to, and you're one of the early classes of TFA, Teach for America. And what, why, did, why did you choose to do that? So, right, so I was um, very radicalized as a, as a, uh, as a college student. Um, in fact, it's interesting to me, I, I, I am a lifelong Democrat. I was sort of born Democrat, always have been, always will be. And so it's interesting to me now because um, I've, I've taken this stand on education reform. Lots of people say, ah, she's a show for the Republican Party. This is the woman who used to, my, the buttons that I used to wear on my, um, on my backpack were, uh, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. And um, <laughs> the other one was Bush, stay out of mine. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I was, I was uh, very, very left-leading. Um, so it's, it's actually been a, a surprising thing to me to, to be in the place now where, you know, sort of people are saying, well, you're not a good Democrat because, you know, of these stances that you're taking on education reform. Um, and perhaps we should talk about that later, sort of, you know, the, the sort of politi partisan politics of it. But I, um, I saw a special um, on PBS about Teach for America um, when I was uh, a senior in college, and I thought it was just amazing. It was, you know, this this uh, journey that they'd shown uh, probably four or five different Teach for America core members going through their experiences, and they had very wide sort of ranging experiences. One of these guys got fired on, you know, national television, and the other one was extraordinarily successful, um, and you could just see him connecting with the kids and. And the bottom line for me was it was young people who were looking to change the world and wanted to do it through education, and I thought that was incredibly inspiring, and so I decided to apply to the program. Now, Teach for America has become very prominent lately, and there have been uh, literally hundreds now of Teach for America uh, teachers in the Kansas City School District and related school districts in the, in the metro area. We've had Wendy Kopp uh, actually here on this stage uh, herself, but your experience at, at TFA in the, I think the third year was a little different. You talk about the sort of summer camp atmosphere and uh, maybe the not completely effective training you got. So Teach for America was still a work in progress when I was going through it, um, and so it certainly had not yet sort of mastered what the summer training should look like. And I think that one thing that you have to really recognize and, and acknowledge Teach for America for is that that organization is an organization that is looking to constantly improve what they are doing. So if you look at the training that the core members go through now uh, versus uh, what we went through, it is a wildly, wildly different world. Um, and uh, having been a superintendent of a school district and seeing Teach for America core members coming into my district as new teachers, uh, you know, you could see that difference, the fact that they were uh, much, much better prepared. Now, one one policy question, or uh, a, a, you know, question about the the nature of school reform in our time 
that, that leads me to ask is, it's taken Teach for America a long time to really find the sweet spot, and, and, and they still have, there's still the criticism of Teach for America, which watching them I think is, though I am a big fan of Teach for America myself, uh, I think it's a fair criticism, which is the, the kids, uh, number one, it's taken them a long time to figure out their kind of training. So in terms of incremental reform versus uh, the kind of reform that you've been associated with, which is immediate and, and, uh, and, and severe, is wide ranging, um, uh, and there's that, and there's also Teach for America's, uh, the quality of the teachers being only around for a couple of years. Uh, now, many of them stay, and we have a lot of teachers in Kansas City who are former Teach for America teachers now, uh, but many of them don't. And, and, and what's your feeling about that, looking at Teach for America today? Is that, is that a problem, or is that an inevitable consequence of the, the general turnover in education? So I'll address both of the questions. In terms of um, Teach for America and the fact that it t it's taken them a while to, to kind of uh, get to the training program that they have now, um, I'd say, look, if there was, if there was a, a, a silver bullet on, um, you know, this is the best teacher training program that's out there, then I think we'd be looking at a, a wildly different situation. But I think that, you know, even schools of education struggle with what should we put in place, what kind of program should we put in place to best uh, produce high quality teachers. And many of the school districts, uh, or the schools of education across the country still struggle with that. Um, so it's not like we have a, an answer to that question. And I think, again, going back to what I said before, the fact that they are constantly trying to improve what they do and acknowledge their shortcomings, I think, is, is one of the most important things about it. Um, in terms of Teach for America teachers' tenures, I'd say this. You know, we're living in a world today where young people who are graduating from college now are going to change careers um, between you know, five and seven times. So this is not changing jobs, but changing careers between five and seven times over their lifetime. Um, so we're not looking at the same kind of situation where people are gonna come into teaching uh, or any profession that, uh, for that matter and stay there for their entire career. Um, so we have to acknowledge that, number one. I'd say the other thing um, to me, and again, this is from my experience as a, as a superintendent, is that I would rather have a great teacher in the classroom for a short period of time than have a ineffective teacher in the classroom for a long period of time. Um, now, what you should not take away from that um, statement is me saying that all Teach for America teachers are great, because they're not. Um, and one of the things that I think is important about reform efforts like Teach for America, the New Teacher Project, which is an organization that I started, New Leaders for New School, I mean, you name any of these uh, organizations, we have to be willing to know that you know, you've got a rigorous uh, selection and, and uh, recruitment process, but some of your teachers are gonna be highly uh, effective and some of them may not be, and the important thing is being able to acknowledge when, when your members are not effective and, and you know, being okay with moving them out of the classroom. And, 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 and let me ask you this question, and I wanna segue this question into your own experience as a teacher, your own growth as a teacher, but a lot of the, the studies, we know there's a, there's a group called Calder in Washington, D.C. that's just released one uh, about this. Um, I forget what that's an acronym for, so I won't try, but, uh, and Harvard has looked at this, there's a Harvard study, about the growth in the first couple of years of teacher effectiveness. And, and typically the first year isn't so great. So the second year is better and the third year is a, l a little better, particularly in, in teachers who end up being lifetime effective teachers. So there's a question here, but, but maybe you can answer it uh, also with your own experience because your first year uh, at Harlem Park in Baltimore as a TFA teacher wasn't so great as, you, as you've indicated, and, right. and, but, but you turned it around. Yeah. And, and how, how did you turn it around and, and who helped you to do that? Yeah. Um, so I do think that there's a, a trajectory on which um, any professional kind of learns their craft and, and improves it. Um, and what the data show is that sort of by the third year, um, teachers really sort of, uh, the, the first two years are the, the, the time where they really do improve their practice tremendously. Um, for me, it was a, a number of different um, things. I um, had the good fortune of having a number of veteran teachers in my school who were not only phenomenal teachers, but who were very open to helping me. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think um, was, was tremendously beneficial to me. Um, I'd also say that uh, between my first and second year of teaching, I attended a professional development session that was really sp 
specifically focused on math education, and in particular something called calendar math. And that really just opened my eyes and changed the entire way that I looked at um, you know, teaching kids uh, taking kids through the process of understanding mathematical skills, so I think that was huge. Um, and then um, my second and third year of teaching, another teacher and I team taught. So we got we, we brought 70 kids into one classroom together, um, and uh, just sort of being in that close proximity with another teacher and constantly thinking together about how we were lesson planning, um, you know, talking about, well, I saw you doing this across the room, did that work, et cetera, and bouncing those ideas off of each other. Um, I think those were all hugely um, beneficial to there, me. There are two things you talk about in, in the book, two moments you talk about in the book that seem to me very important. It seemed to be very hard uh, to put into a formula for good teaching. It, 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 it must come naturally to you, it seems to me. Um, it's the, 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 two, the two are, one, you, you work a, walk a kid, I think his name was Craig Robinson, home from being a disruptive kid. We walk him to, him, to his home yeah. with various people in the school saying you can't do that. Um, and, and confront his parents or parent and, and, uh, and, and help solve, solve the problem. The, the guys who started the KIPP schools talk about that kind of experience where they wanted, they went, one of them went, went home with a kid and, the, and they came back to the school and said, you can't do that. Uh, but, but, but you did that. Yeah. And then the other moment is what I call uh, the 36 pizzas moment. Um, where, you, where you made 36 individual pizzas to demonstrate, I think, a math, yeah. your calendar math uh, issue for your students. And that's so way over the top. Yeah. I mean, a great teaching moment. I, I don't remember any of my teachers cooking pizzas for me, <laughs> wistfully, he said. But, you, you know, it, it, that, those, those are pretty special moments. Yeah. So uh, with, with Craig, the story was that um, this young man was, um, was a troublemaker in my classroom. He was always instigating fights, et cetera. Uh, and I didn't quite know what to do. Um, and I had tried to call the home several times and never got a response. And my um, assistant principal at the time said, you know, you gotta get out into the community. If you wanna talk to his mom, then you've gotta you know, go to the house. And so despite the fact that lots of people in the school, to your point, said, oh no, you don't, you don't, wanna, you know, you don't wanna cross over that road, you don't wanna get into that neighborhood, et cetera, um, I decided that I was gonna do that. So after school, um, I, you know, cause all day long I'd been saying to him, you know, if you don't, if you don't straighten up, then I'm gonna have to uh, go to your house with you. And I think that he thought that was crazy and was just sort of bluffing. Um, but after school ended, the bell rang and I um, grabbed this little boy's hand and um, started walking him home. Now, uh, even though he was only eight years old, he had pride. And so as we were walking down the street, passing all of his buddies and the older kids were all, you know, pointing at him and going, ah, Craig has to get walked home by his teacher. Look, she's holding his hand and he's trying to get his hand out of my grasp and I am not letting go of that. Um, uh, so he was, you know, uh, tormented a little bit on the way uh, there. And when I got there, you know, his mom was there. I told her what the situation was. She was like, I will assure you that you will not have any more problems with him. But honestly, I think that it was probably less the mom telling him and more the fact that he wanted to avoid ever having to be seen with me in public again. <laughs> Uh, that was the impetus for a, a behavioral change with him. But, you know, it was important for me to, to make the extra effort to go to his house to have contact with his mom and, and, and you know, to, to, to be able to sort of, you know, uh, have the experience of, of walking the route that he did every day and seeing, you know, some of the challenges that he was facing on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that was incredibly important. So, so you do this for three years in, in, in this inner city school in, in, in Baltimore, and you become a successful teacher. Uh, and, uh, it, but instead of going on with teaching or becoming a, an assistant principal or doing, doing what would be a normal career path, you, you decide, and I think in, in conversation with Wendy Kopp, to start an organization to recruit teachers uh, called the New Teacher Project. Um, and, and, uh, and, and begin to recruit teachers for, for a lot of larger school districts. How, how does that happen and how, how is that different? What, what did you see the difference between what you were doing with the New Teacher Project and what Wendy uh, Kopp was doing with Teach for America? Yeah. So I started the New Teacher Project because I believe so strongly in the power of teachers to change the face of education and to change the lives of kids. Uh, and I think that we should aspire as a country to ensure that every child is in the classroom of, a, of an effective teacher every single day because we know what kind of an impact that can have. 
Um, Teach for America to me seemed very limited because it was just focused on you know getting college kids who were not school of, you know did not graduate from a school of education and kind of getting them to go into inner city and rural public schools, which I thought was a very noble and worthwhile effort. But I thought that it was limited, and so part of what um, we looked into at the New Teacher Project was. Can we compel, for example, mid-career professionals, people who have gone off, become doctors, lawyers, investment bankers, could we talk those people who have extraordinary experiences and content knowledge uh, into you know, becoming teachers? And, and actually, one of our earliest uh, programs was uh, supported by the, um, the Kaufman Foundation here in Kansas City, and it was called the Kansas City uh, Teaching Fellows Project. And so what we did was we recruited those mid-career professionals from all across uh, both Can uh, Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri to enter into some of the most challenging uh, schools in those two districts, and I think it was extraordinarily successful. Um, so that was one thing that we did. The other thing that we did at the New Teacher Project was we wanted to work with school districts to improve the processes that were in place to recruit uh, traditionally trained teachers as well. Because what we were hearing from a lot of people who were coming from schools of education was that they wanted to teach in a high need school district. You know, They wanted to teach in the Kansas City, Missouri school district, for example, but they were having a really hard time because they couldn't get their phone calls answered from the central administration, their applications had been lost. You know, Meanwhile, the suburban school districts were much more efficient and effective and were offering them jobs in January and February, and they weren't hearing anything from the urban school districts. So the urban school districts were so many times set up in a way where the HR department was not, um, did not have the processes in place to make sure that they were getting the best uh, graduates from the School of Education. So we wanted to work with them to improve their processes it, as well. And that really resonated with me because I was involved a little bit in, uh, in the, the, the Kansas City School District's first effort to bring some Teach for America teachers in. And I believe that they'd successfully negotiated not only with the district, but with, uh, with the union and, and others. And 100 teachers were about to show up from T TFA. Um, and it was precisely this kind of uh, HR department, IT department uh, screw up uh, that was pretty massive and they couldn't take all the teachers in and some of them ended up going to independence and, and into charter schools and elsewhere which they, where they weren't supposed to go yeah. uh, initially largely because of an organizational inability for the district to, yeah. uh, to pull them in. I, I wrote a, a piece for the Downtown Council's Education Committee which I said Organizationally, the Kansas City School District uh, is the most dysfunctional organization I've ever encountered. Uh, and, and, and it led to that kind of problem, where even with everyone yeah. agreeing that they should come in, they couldn't come in. Yeah. Whereas you, you, you talk about the math and science teacher problem yeah. that we have in, in America, where it's said that we can't get people who teach content, who know the content of math and science in middle school and whatnot, which has been a problem in, in yeah. districts in Kansas City. It doesn't really, the problem yeah, it, doesn't it's, exist it's, in the way we think it does. It's very significant. I mean, the Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri school districts were part of a study that we had done at the New Teacher Project. Um, and one of the findings was that if you looked at the applicant pool, the people who had applied to the districts initially, the applicant pool was actually very strong when you looked at it from the standpoint of you know, GPAs and uh, ACT and SAT scores, and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and the quality of the applicant pool was actually much stronger than the quality of the people who were ultimately hired. And so what we saw was that there was a ma massive drop off of a lot of the best applicants because they became so frustrated with the process. And so it was a real missed opportunity for the district because you had these people who applied and wanted to teach in the district, but because of the bureaucracy of the central office, you, the district wasn't able to capitalize on those people. And you know, the bottom line is I, I saw this firsthand when I was in DC, um, where the bureaucracy and the just utter inefficiencies and dysfunction of the central office was a huge detriment to what teachers and principals were trying to do in the schools every day. So I would come into work uh, in DC and I would, you know, for, I'll give you a quick example. Um, when, I, when I first got there, um, in one of my first couple of weeks, I got a, a call from a, a woman who was actually a friend of mine. We had gone through the Teach for America program together and she was um, now a principal of a school in DC. 
she called me and she said, first of all, you know, congratulations, it's so great to have you here. She said, second of all, I have an issue. Summer school is about to start in a couple of days and the air conditioning doesn't work. And I have been trying to call um, you know, folks at the central office and I can't get my calls returned and I know these 300 kids are gonna show up and it's just gonna be a travesty because it's 90 degrees out. Uh, and so I, you know, call down to the maintenance department. I say, you need to get a, a truck over there to the school as soon as possible. Um, and, you know, the next day the woman calls me back and she's like, I, I don't know if you can do this about everything, but, it, it, you know, if you can, then I'm on board because the, your, your crew showed up, they fixed the air conditioning, like, this is such a massive change. And so shortly after she called, the guy who was sort of the head of the maintenance department called me, he was very proud of himself, and so he's like, you know, we got that truck over that school, you know, we did a good job, and I said, so here's the thing, you shouldn't just react like that when I call you. That should be your reaction when anybody from the school calls you, whether it's the principal, whether it's the teacher, those, those sorts of circumstances are unacceptable, and now that I know that you have the ability to do that when asked, I'm going to hold you accountable in a different way. And um, you know, that was part of the problem that we were facing was that people didn't understand that the actions that they either took or didn't take at the central office had a massive, massive impact on our schools every day. Um, and so if you happen not to get to that call or not to fill out that purchase order or whatever, it meant that the kids weren't gonna have air conditioning or they weren't gonna have books or they weren't gonna be able to you know, have the breakfast uh, in the classroom. Um, and, and that sort of accountability of, of making people at the central office understand that for every action or inaction that you take, kids and teachers and principals in the schools are gonna suffer every day and just changing the paradigm on which people operated one of the things that used to drive me crazy when I used to walk through the central office um, every day was people would sort of, you know, be on the phone, half paying attention, half looking at their cell phone, drinking their coffee, rolling their eyes, acting annoyed, you know, oh, that person's calling, I can't believe that parent is calling again, that sort of thing. And I would say, these people are our customer. I mean, they are the people that we are here to serve. If you think that it is an inconvenience, to answer the call from a teacher whose health insurance hasn't been put through, or a parent who can't get their child the, the, the special ed services that they need, then you don't belong here. Uh, we, we have to be operating in a paradigm where you understand that we only exist in service of the schools and the people who are in those schools. And that, <laughs> that cultural, that, that cultural shift was one of the most important things that we could do as a central office. So, so we've gotten you now to, to D.C. where uh -huh. you, you, you're, you're made the superintendent uh, after only three years as a, as a teacher and, and, and your time in the, uh, the New Teacher Project. Joel Klein, uh, whom you provided a lot of teachers for out of the New Teacher Project, recommended you, I think, and Adrian Fenney made a major political, put his political life on the line, as it turned out, yes. uh, uh, to do that. By the, by the way, I should say that uh, Adrian Fenney got his start in politics working for Kevin Chavis as yes. his aide. Kevin's been on this stage uh, before, uh, been here in Kansas City a, a couple of times, um, and uh, uh, who was a D.C. City Councilman, by the way, and Chairman of the Education Committee, and helped start school choice in, in uh, D.C. Um, but there's also a library story you tell that's a little bit like the story you just, you just, you just told uh, about going to the Benning School and, the, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the principal shows you the library without books. Yeah. And, 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 that, uh, and he says, why pretend to have a library uh, when you don't have any books? And, and the interesting thing about that to me was, here's DC, which had, roughly speaking, the highest per pupil expenditure of any school in the United States, and yet, again, maybe a bureaucratic thing, certainly a, a will, a question of will and discipline thing, that they didn't have any books in the, in the library despite the highest per pupil expenditure. That's right, I mean, this was actually my first visit to a school on my very first day, uh, Benning Elementary, and um, like Crosby was saying, we walked by this room that was, you know, uh, the, the door was closed, the lights were off, and there were some bookshelves that were sort of, you know, kind of very disheveled looking. Uh, and I said, you know, what, what is that room? And the principal said, well, um, that's the library. And I said, why aren't there any books in the library? And he said, well, if we don't have books and we don't have supplies, then why, why pretend? Uh, and it was 
just an extraordinarily sh shocking experience for me to have. And in my first few months uh, in the school district, as I visited schools and sat in communities and sat in people's living rooms all across the city, I was noticing this incredibly disturbing trend where many of our schools didn't have libraries open and, and books on the shelves. Um, I went to lots of um, meetings where when I asked the community, what could we do to make the schools better? And they said, well, you know, we need art and music and PE and um, you know, th those kinds of extracurriculars. And I was thinking to myself, those are not extracurricular activities. Those are a part of a broad-based curriculum that every child should have access to. And what I realized was that the school district was operating such that even though we, ha we were spending more money per kid than almost any other urban jurisdiction in the country, when you went out into the schools, they didn't feel rich. We were, we were operating in these dilapidated buildings with these lack of supplies and resources. I would go to the wealthier parts of town, though. And interestingly, they would all have a music teacher, an art teacher. And what I realized was that those communities had the wherewithal so that the parent groups would hold an auction every year. And through that auction, they would raise three or four or five hundred thousand dollars. And with those dollars, they would hire themselves those kinds of teachers. And that's why there was this huge misalignment because the wealthier communities sort of basically raised the money to hire those teachers and the poorer communities did not. And Take, take into consideration this statistic. We were spending $1 billion per year on public education in the district. And when I looked into it, of that billion dollars, only 403 million were going into the schools and into the classrooms. That means the majority of money was being sucked up by this incredibly inefficient and, and dysfunctional bureaucracy. I'll give you a quick example. Um, one day I walked onto a floor in the central office and there were literally a hundred people who were working in the after school department and office. And I was thinking, what, what do all these people do? And they're like, well, they help to coordinate the after school programs. I was like, you know how they could really help to coordinate the after school programs? Have them working in the schools. Um, and people were like, well, no, that's no, these people came out of the schools because, you know, we've made them, you know, we've promoted them and that sort of thing. And what we realized very quickly was that we could redeploy those resources, right, all these central office bureaucrats who were sitting there, we could redeploy those resources and allow every school to hire a full-time after-school coordinator with those funds and have some left over for supplies and books and that sort of thing. So um, it was, it, it, it was a, there's a real difference, I think, and, and, and one of the things that we stress at Students First is the need for communities to really demand transparency in school spending, understanding where the dollars are going, because in Washington, D.C., where we were spending a whole lot of money, if what I would have been arguing for was more money, I, would, I can guarantee you that it would have been putting good money after bad, you know, further bloating the bureaucracy. The question was, where were those dollars being spent? And what we had to focus on was less, let's bring more money into the district and let's take the money that we do have and try to figure out how to put more of it into the classroom where it's gonna have the biggest impact. Okay, now, now we're gonna to come to some of the controversial part of the program because when, when you, you noticed all this, there are 90 pink what slips for, uh, for, for administrators, but there were also, you, you had a problem that we'll recognize here in Kansas City, and our superintendent, uh, Dr. Covington, dealt with it in a similar uh, massive, maybe a more massive way than you, than you did. Uh, you had uh, too many schools, uh, too many administrators, uh, and so you gave pink slips to the administrators, but you also closed schools and you fired teachers, 227, something like that, uh, at, the, at the beginning, um, 36 principals, 22 assistant principals, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, the, the, obviously some of it is because you needed to make it smaller, but you also tried to do it based on performance metrics, based on, on some uh, analysis of quality, and here's, here's where the argument, uh, the argument begins. How did you how did you do that? The the, the AFT was not happy about it. Uh, the union, which is similar to our union here uh, uh, in in Washington, uh, what were the metrics you put into place to do that? Sure. So um, I think what you're referring to, well, I, I had a lot of controversy, so we can talk about all of them, but um, the one I think you're referring to is when we had, um, uh, in I think it was the end of my third year or in my uh, or 
in my second year, beginning of my third year, we had a situation where we had a budget crisis, much like most of the school districts across the country at the time. Um, and given that a huge percentage of our expenditures was in staffing, uh, we had to do layoffs. And we had to lay off uh, about 260 teachers. Um, at the time, the district had traditionally done layoffs by, on a strict seniority basis. So uh, we were implementing what we call la LIFO, or last in, first out. If you were the last teacher hired, you had to be the first teacher fired, regardless of performance. Um, and we didn't think that that made any sense whatsoever. Um, we believed uh, that it was an unfortunate situation, that, that layoffs had to occur. Nobody ever likes to be in that place. But we also believed that if that was the situation that we had to do our best to ensure that the um, that it was that, that those layoffs were going to have the least amount of impact on the kids, which we believe meant that we needed to do those layoffs by quality and not just seniority. Um, and so we went through a process where we um, this was before the implementation of our new teacher evaluation system, but it was sort of a precursor to that. We asked um, the principals to um, evaluate the teachers based on a number of different metrics, um, and then we did the layoffs uh, based on that. And it caused a tremendous amount of consternation, uh, you know. And I'll, I'll share with you one story in particular because the bottom line is that. That notion that we should look not just at how long somebody's been here, but how much value they're adding to the school and to the classroom is one that I feel like the vast majority of you in this room and the vast majority of Americans would agree with, right? Let's, let's make sure that we're saving the, the, the most effective teachers. Um, the, the, the sort of controversy that came out of that, I thought got very disturbing when I had a meeting with um, an elected official uh, and because this was sort of becoming uh, a major story in the, um, the city, he sort of, you know, was grandstanding and, you know, during this meeting with me, he said, I am going to demand right now that you reinstate all 266 of the wrongfully terminated teachers. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I said, you have four children, none of whom attend the D.C. public schools. If you agree to bring one of your children back into our system and allow me to assign one of these ineffective teachers that I have just let go to teach your child, then I'll bring that person back. And if you bring all four of your kids back into the system and allow them to be taught by these ineffective teachers, I'll bring four teachers back. You can bring your aunts and your uncles, kids, whoever, in your family that you can bring back into the system and, and you will allow them to be taught by one of these ineffective teachers and I will bring a, a, one of these teachers back, one, restore one of these jobs for every one of your family members. Needless to say, he did not take me up on that offer. It is amazing to me how public officials across this country are willing to make policies, put policies in place for other people's children that they would never ever accept for their own. That's one of the things that I think we, we have to change, the dynamics that we have to change. The, the idea that we should, um, you know, look, I, I know school closures, as an example, are an incredibly difficult uh, process for a community to go through, um, but the, the notion that, you know, um, we shouldn't close failing schools is one that I think we really have to talk about as a nation, as a community, because you know, the, the, the idea that we should keep the school open uh, even though it's failing and it's been failing for decades, well, whose children are you expecting to, to attend that school every day? And unless you are willing to say, I will put my kid in that school and wait to see if it can get better, for the people who are willing to do that, I, then, then you are allowed to take that stance. But if you have your kid tucked up in a high-performing school somewhere and you're trying to subjugate other people's children to that fate, that's where I have a problem. Yep. It's also true that then as you began to negotiate the, the contract with the, the teachers union, Rand, Randy Weingarten, who had been head of the New York Teachers Union and became head of the AFT nationally, actually decided to negotiate directly uh, with you. 
And, and, and there was a lot of give and take uh, in that, uh, some, some e quick exits from the room on, uh, from bo by both of you uh, from time to time. But you, you proposed a, a system wh whereby you would have these metrics in place to, to do teacher evaluation and, and, and would end seniority and tenure as, as it had been known in Washington uh, up to that point, but also on the other side give uh, the ability raise raise average teacher salaries, raise the basic teacher salaries pretty dramatically, and also offer the, uh, this pay for performance that could take teachers up to very dramatically high salaries with bonuses or or simply increase in salary. Yeah. So it, it was interesting because what we had originally proposed um, to the union was that we would um, take on a system where uh, teachers would have a choice. And their choice could be that they could either choose to maintain their, their current sort of seniority protections and rules and, and, and uh, tenure and that sort of thing, um, or they could choose to a, a different program where they would actually give up the seniority protections and the tenure protections, et cetera, um, and that they would be then um, in a program where if they were achieving at high levels, uh, they could be, essentially, if they were a highly effective teacher teaching in a high need school and, um, and a high need subject area, that they could make double what they were in the old system. Um, and the reason why we had put this together was our, our local union president said, look, there are some people who would be okay with that, but the others who aren't, you can't force people who have sort of come into the system under certain understandings. Uh, so we said, okay, let, let's just give teachers a choice. Um, and uh, the, union, the, the national union was very against that notion. What they said was that they didn't want people at, at the same school working under different work rules, um, which I didn't, I, I didn't sort of know what the, the genesis of that concern was because I thought, look, te teachers um, you know, are professionals. Uh, they're smart people. They can sort of make the choices that they think make the most sense for them. Um, so it was difficult. At the end of the day, though, what we ultimately ended up negotiating was a contract that um, where we didn't have seniority and tenure protections uh, uh, in place for, for, for any of the people. So everybody was the same, but we kind of didn't have uh, seniority and tenure. I will say this, though, that it wasn't as if then we had something in place where you know, teachers became just kind of uh, subject to arbitrary and capricious behaviors on behalf of the, t uh, the principals, et cetera. Um, that was not the case. We did have due process uh, in place where uh, if a, a teacher felt that they were being treated unfairly or, or, or uh, something like that, that, we had a process through which they could grieve that. Um, they just, we didn't have the same uh, things in place that basically we did before, which, which was, um, teachers, uh, ineffective teachers, could essentially stay in their jobs forever. Um, and it wasn't helping the district. And, and honestly, the people who had the least amount of tolerance for ineffective teachers was effective teachers. We found that effective teachers, it just drove them nuts when they saw their colleagues who weren't, weren't pulling their fair share, weren't pulling their weight, and then you inherited a class of people from that person who was further behind, et cetera. So we, we felt that we are, what we came to understand over time, because once we, once we decided on this, um, this, this new contract, we said, okay, now we're gonna pay teacher, all teachers a whole lot more money. For the highly effective teachers, they're gonna be you know, able to make double the amount of money, et cetera, but we're gonna be able to do a layoffs by equality instead of seniority and remove ineffective uh, employees, et cetera. Um, the union, even though they fought us tooth and nail on that, when it finally went to a vote of the rank and file, it passed 80% to 20%. And, and, and the the success of this in, uh, was, was, was significant in terms of reaching, reaching some goals relative to the teachers and, and, the, and the measurement system, and also the scores were going up uh, in, in, in your three years uh, at, at DC. But the criticism that's come later, the, uh, the challenge to this is that because high stakes testing was a part of this, the, the student achievement data is a part of it. There's, there's more, much more to it, and we can get to the whole set of, the whole range of teacher evaluation. We talk about students first, but uh, is, is that it could lead to cheating, mm -hmm. and indeed there, 
There, there has been uh, a, there's a memo that came out in 2008, and, and then there's some follow-up. There's a guy named John Merrow who's been writing articles about it, a PBS guy, uh, about the possibility that there was a massive cheating scandal mm -hmm. uh, in D.C. Uh, with erasures on tests. They, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, 170 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and one school in particular where uh, Aiton, I think it's called, uh, where, where it was clear that maybe as many as six teachers, teachers and or principals, uh, engaged in, in changing of test uh, answers. Yeah. And, and, and your response to that, uh, I mean, let me ask you the question this way. Can high stakes testing, which is, is going to obviously affect the reputation of the school, the principal, and the, and the livelihood of the teacher, there's almost a, an inevitability to some cheating going on, isn't there? So, I mean, I'm not against I'm not saying I'm against yeah. it, but I'm saying how, that, that clearly is a potential problem, yeah. maybe a real problem in the case of this school or, or the district in your tenure. Yeah. So I want to sort of address two pieces of the, the question. The first is um, the, the use and the existence of standardized testing. And I think what's important in this realm is, um, is that we need to have some balance, right? Uh, we can't have no assessments and no consistent standardized ways of measuring whether kids are you know, learning and, and no one are able to do the things that we want them to at a specific grade level. We have to have that. Um, on the other end of the extreme, though, which I think is also incredibly detrimental, is the overemphasis on testing. And I say this both as an educator or superintendent who saw things happen like, um, you know, principals who'd say, okay, for eight weeks before the test, we're going to shut down everything and not do anything but test prep for, you know, English and math, which was just ridiculous, to as a parent, right? My child came home from school last year uh, in April, and I said, where's your homework? She said, oh, we don't have any homework. In fact, um, I, we're not really going to school anymore. We, uh, we have lots of field trips and field days and all these things planned. And I said, why don't you have any homework? Why are you going on all these field trips? And she said, because the TCAP is over. That's the state test in, in the state that I live in. And I thought, if I was a parent who didn't know anything else, I would think, what is this TCAP? I don't like it. Um, because if what the kids are all, what the kids are hearing, is that learning is over once the TCAP is over, then, then we're operating in a skewed uh, and very detrimental environment. So the bottom line is, should we have an overemphasis on testing? No. Do we need to have some testing that we can use as a tool? Yes. Um, so that's the first thing. The second piece about what you would say is the inevitability of, of cheating, I would say this. I, I, I have a tremendous amount of faith and confidence in the educators in this country, and I very, very firmly believe that the vast majority of teachers and principals would never, ever compromise their personal or professional integrity and cheat on a test because they know that that would be cheating students. Um, does that mean that a, a small number of people are not going to do that? Sure. There, there, there may, in every city, in every school district, be a small number of people who make the wrong decision, decide to cheat on the test. Those people should, be, should, should have very significant consequences for their actions. But to say that because we're setting up an environment that then teachers are going to do the wrong thing, I think that's an incredible insult to teachers everywhere. I just do not think that they would, that they would do that. Um, let me say a little bit more about the, the, the controversy in DC. Um, so there was, there was a question about whether or not there were extraordinarily high numbers of erasures. Were there, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, cheat, was there a lot of cheating going on, et cetera? Let me just state this. Since that time, there have been six different investigations that have been conducted about that year that is in question. All six of those investigations, including one that was conducted by the um, Office of the Inspector General for the city of D.C., and one which was conducted by the federal government, all six of them showed that there was no evidence of widespread cheating in the district, all of them. And yet still this controversy seems to sort of brew on. And, you know, what I would say to that, because, you know, honestly, it, a lot of the teachers' union leadership are the people who are saying, you know, it need, that we need to have a seventh investigation. And what I would say to those folks is, imagine that the tables were turned and a, and a particular union member, a teacher, um, was accused of some wrongdoing and that there had been six different investigations, all of which found, no, the teacher had done nothing wrong. And somebody was out there saying, there must be a seventh investigation. You know, who, at some point, 
you know, we have to be able to say what, what is a reasonable thing to, to expect, and when the federal government is investigating and finding that no wrongdoing has occurred, I would say it's time to put that to bed. Okay. Um, testing, just one more question about testing. It, uh, reading No Child Left Behind, probably the same thing is true of the Common Core that we're about to, about to see come down. There, there wasn't that much testing mandated. And it's really that this, you know, and I said this at a, a forum we had at Kauffman Foundation, the guy who's head of the biology department at Emporia State, also head of biology pedagogy at Emporia State said, well, that may be true, but I'll tell you what, that's not what's actually happening in the state of Kansas. 30% of the time of the teachers that I train and send out into the schools is spent teaching to the test. And I said, that can't be true. And he said, it absolutely is true. And I began to look at the state what the state was encouraging people to do, what some of the districts were, were encouraging people to do. And that does seem to be the response to high stakes testing at, at the state level is to, in, and at the district level, is to encourage the teaching to the test. How, how do we stop that? Can we build into the Common Core, No Child Left Behind? Can yeah. we tell people not to do that? I mean, what? There, there are two things that I think we need to, we need to do. First is, and I, I referred to this earlier, um, Every child should have access to a broad-based curriculum, not because we want kids to have access to art and music and PE, but because the research is very clear that children who have access to a broad-based curriculum actually do better academically. So if what we want is higher academic achievement levels, then we, we can't just have this overemphasis on the test, et cetera. We, we have to make sure that every kid is in those art and music classes. Um, so, so that's the, the, the first thing. Um, I'd say, you know, the, the, the second thing uh, is that it's, it's, it's incredibly um, disturbing to sort of see the, the trends that are in existence right now, um, you know, over these, these kinds of topics. And at the end of the day, what, what we know um, is that, you know, with, with Common Core and, and Common Assessments, we have to ensure that we are doing for kids what we want for our own, what we would want for our own children. Um, and, um, you know, whether we have sort of too much testing or not too much testing, I think we have to look at the, what the data and the research says. And what the research says is pretty clear, which is that teachers who actually teach to the test, their children, their students do not do as well as teachers who teach higher order thinking skills. And, uh, and critical thinking skills and use Bloom's taxonomy, et cetera. Those teachers, those, those effective teachers who are, who are not teaching to the test but truly are focused on student learning, their kids do better on the test as a result of that, but they're not teaching to the test, meaning the drill and kill and that sort of thing. I think the tendency of state level bureaucrats, of district folks, and sometimes of, of, of principals to try to narrow teachers um, uh, and how they spend their time onto that is honestly a function of not understanding what works. Because if they saw those two pieces of research that I'm talking about, they saw that kids who had access to a broad-based curriculum do better academically, and saw that teachers who teach to the test their kids actually don't do as well as teachers who are teaching critical thinking skills, that they would know then that was not a good strategy. But I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding of that and people you know sort of their knee-jerk reaction is okay let's over focus on the test when in fact it's not effective to do so well and, and, and now let's segue to uh, to students first and what you're what you're doing with with students first and particularly on this question of teacher evaluation I, I, I went to your website and I looked at the uh, it, w well first of all maybe you should explain exactly what students first sure. is it's, it's essentially an advocacy organization yeah. looking to help states uh, encourage states, lobby states to, to maintain high standards in terms of teacher quality, in particular teacher evaluation? Well, there's three areas that we focus on. Um, one is making sure there's a highly effective principal leading every school and a highly effective teacher in every classroom. Uh, the second area that we focus on is parental um, knowledge and empowerment, um, creating an environment where no family ever feels like they are, uh, kids are trapped in a failing school without better options. And the third area that we focus on is um, governance and financial uh, accountability and responsibility, making sure that every taxpayer dollar that's spent on education is being spent effectively. So we have 37 different policies that fall within those three areas. Um, and teacher evaluation is one of those. And, and, and the, the second one, the, the encouraging uh, 
uh, parental involvement and parental choice, giving parents choices. Essentially, you're talking about school choice there yes. and, and alternatives to, uh, to district monopolies, yeah. either inside the district with charters or yeah. other alternatives or, uh, or, or even vouchers or mm -hmm. uh, tax credits, I assume, or other, other things. Kansas City, interestingly, as you're probably, probably aware, has got one of the highest percentages of, uh, uh, of charter schools of, yeah. uh, of any. Um, the, the, you do rank Missouri and Kansas in the teacher evaluation on your, on your website for Students First, and, and it's a one to four ranking. Um, and, and not many, many states do, do terribly well, but, but uh, uh, Kansas gets a zero and Missouri gets a one in our uh, uh, state, state level standards for, for teacher evaluation. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what sure. goes into that? Sure. Um, so we think that an effective teacher evaluation uh, and a rigorous teacher evaluation system is necessary in every state across this country. We believe that it should be um, uh, strongly guided at the state level with some uh, customization and modifications being able to be made at the local level. Um, but we believe very strongly that a teacher evaluation system should look through multiple lenses at how effective a teacher is. If you look at teacher evaluation systems that exist today, um, most teachers would tell you that they're not particularly helpful. It's the opinion of one person, your principal, and what they happen to, to think of you on, on one particular day. Uh, so if you ask most teachers across the country, they'll tell you that the, that the evaluation system is not a particularly helpful professional development tool. We think that teachers should be evaluated based on multiple measures, um, that a significant portion of their evaluation should be based on the student achievement growth of the children in their classroom, um, but that it needs to be done in a very fair way. It cannot be done based on absolutes. So you can't sort of mandate, okay, in order for you to be you know, qualified or uh, uh, named a highly effective teacher, 80% of the children in your classroom need to be on grade level because some people walk into their classrooms and on day one, 90% of their kids are already on grade level. It has to be level. based on growth, right. where and, the kids start right. and, and, and you're, you're adding value teachers, to that. And other teachers you know, walk in and on the first day of school, 13% of their kids are on grade level. Um, and so you can't expect those, those teachers at the end of one year to see the same amount of growth. You have to measure where are your students when they start the school year, where did they end the school year, and how much did they grow? Not only that, but the, the evaluation system that we created in DC uh, also took into consideration um, and what we said, controlled out for factors that are outside of the purview of teachers. So for example, one teacher said to me, well, I'm okay being held accountable for growth um, if you do it in a fair way, but um, for example, what about the kid who comes into my classroom three weeks before the test? I haven't even had that child and that I'm gonna be held accountable for uh, their growth when they started and spent most of their uh, year in the classroom of another teacher, that made sense. So we controlled out for attendance in the model that we created. So as long as it's done in a, in a way that is, again, fair and transparent, the, having that growth piece is an important part. We also advocate for um, uh, classroom observations to be a, a significant portion uh, of what is, um, what, how a teacher is evaluated, and we think people should be going into the classroom and looking at day-to-day -day practices. We also think that some promising things um, that research has shown to be uh, highly correlated with teacher effectiveness also are, are um, things like student and parent surveys. Um, but we also advocate for, for things, um, what we call contributions to school community. So if a teacher is going above and beyond the call of duty, they, um, they are taking kids on college field trips, they're uh, you know, um, sponsoring the yearbook and the debate society and the, um, you know, the newspaper, et cetera, that that should be taken into account as well. So we think that teachers' effectiveness should be evaluated based on multiple measures. I'm going to ask you one last question, then we'll turn it over to the audience to ask some, some questions. Uh, but you, you write uh, in more than one uh, place in your book, and there's been a lot of conversation, including some conversation in this community, about the success of the Finnish school system, the school system in Finland, which is now ranked number one. And it, and it wasn't ranked number one as recently as the mid-80s or even, uh, I think, the early 90s. It was you know, in mid-level 
uh, of the uh, advanced industrial countries, and it's turned around to, to this very uh, high level of education. And we know a couple of things are true about it, which is hard to understand exactly how they do it for a variety of reasons. We know that, that, that they have, they're, they're, they're taking from the top 10% of all students uh, in, in Finland to become teachers. Uh, that, that they have a 10% acceptance rate into schools of education, faculties of education, they call them, despite the fact that they only pay the teachers 70% of what we pay our teachers on, on average. But at the same time, they also don't do high stakes testing. Um, they don't, the national standards are very limited. They don't do early childhood education, any ma many mandated early childhood education. Why are they so successful? What turned things around in, in Finland? So I think it, with Finland, it's important to know that there were two phases of reform in Finland. What it took for Finland to get from not so good to solid was different from what it looked like to get from solid to great. So when they were in not so good a situation, they actually put three things in place. Um, one was they had an extraordinary focus on teacher quality and changing to that dynamic where really only the cream of the crop could make it through, make it into and through a school of education program. So that was the first thing that they did. The second thing that they did was they put in place very, very rigorous uh, national uh, curricular standards. Um, so they were very clear on what they wanted all of the kids to be able to achieve. Uh, and then the third thing that they put in place was um, a, a very actually, um, a stringent model of a centralized look at how schools were performing. So there was a centralized department and function that went out to schools and evaluated how all of those schools were doing. That was the first phase. And those three reforms took them from not so good to really solid. Once they got to a place where it was really the most talented people who were in the classrooms, et cetera, then they could shift to more of a uh, hands-off model where they weren't um, you know, kind of uh, uh, laying out and prescribing every single little thing because they had a different uh, cadre of people in the classroom who had extraordinarily high expectations. Um, so I think that if we were to look at Finland now and what we do and say we should do exactly what they do, it would be ignoring the kind of process that they've gone through as a country. Okay. Well, I, I do have one other suggestion for you that might, might uh, reveal the truth is Finland has the highest level, and it's for a long time, had the highest level of library usage of any place in the world. <laughs> and also, this may seem random, but I think you'll understand, as we're Midwesterners, that, it, that it's not 80% of Finns self-identify as Lutherans, though they are secular culture. And as we know from Garrison Keillor, all Lutherans are above average. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, we'd, we'd like to take, if uh, it's okay with uh, Michelle, some questions now. We did uh, promise the, our friends at the AFT that they would get four, maybe 10 questions or so. Good evening, Ms. Reed. Yeah. yeah, if you come up to, um, the, to the microphones. T tonight, you spoke about parents not putting their child in a classroom with ineffective teachers. Uh, you talked about the difficulties that you had as a uh, first-year teacher, and then your book, The Bee Eater, during your first year of teaching, you said that you were clueless and that your classroom was described by outside evaluators as dangerous. Um, as a teacher with such a dismal record and only three years of classroom experience, why do you consider yourself an expert in school reform? So I think one of the things to, to understand about this, and I think honesty is, is very important in this, I, I became an effective teacher, but I was not an effective teacher at the start. And I think that one of the things that we have to be able to look at is, is a teacher improving over time? Because not everybody is going to be great the moment that they enter into the classroom. The key that I think that we have to be looking for is, does that person, is that person able to take professional development and then apply it to their practice every day, and then do we see a difference in what's happening? And I think as long as we are seeing those things happen, right, on a consistent basis, then we should be encouraging that to continue and happen. Um, I think I had an experience that was extraordinarily valuable in that I wasn't a particularly effective teacher at the beginning. I think I became a very effective teacher by the end. Um, and because of that experience, because I knew what it was like to, to be in that role, but also to know what it was like to be in the classroom, I think then becoming a superintendent and having that 
vantage point of not only having been a teacher and not having been able to get the supplies and the books that I needed, but also being a, a parent of children who were in the public school, I think that, that it, it was a, a, um, a, a, a important group of experiences to have. Um, I, look, if, if, if I could say you know, I was perfect from the get-go of what I was doing, I actually don't think that I would have been as effective a superintendent, honestly. I have a question about our neighborhood charter school. It's been in existence for 14 years, very low performing school historically, is in the first year of a three year turnaround grant. One week ago, the state commissioner of education, who as you know is a long ways away in the middle of the state, pulled the school's charter and said they would not be funding it beyond today. Um, now fortunately a judge stepped in and ordered the school year to proceed to the end of June. But it really does raise a question, and as Crosby noted, we have a high number of charter schools in this district. When do you determine that a school, and this school was hitting all the right notes, the art, the music, the PE, the community involvement, the repeat customers, uh, when do you determine that that school is in fact going away, and, and then how do you, do you have any ideas about winding these projects down so you don't inflict the kind of yeah. chaos and terror in the families yeah. that the state did last yeah. week? Um, so a couple of things. One, I am a huge fan of effective schools. Whether it's a traditional public school, whether it's a charter school, whether it's a private school, if you're effective, then I'm, I'm all for you. Um, but I am not for ineffective schools. And I feel like one of the the dynamics that has kind of arisen uh, in, in school reform over the last decade or so is you have people who are charter advocates who believe that charters are the answer. You know, we should charterize the whole district and all this sort of stuff. And even though I'm a, an, a fan of effective charter schools, I actually don't think that that's the answer. And moreover, I think that we have to be extraordinarily rigorous about closing down low-performing charter schools. The whole notion around charter schools is that you have increased authority and autonomy for increased accountability. You're given a charter for a certain period of time. If you are not able to meet certain academic metrics, then your charter should be revoked and it should be taken away. Uh, and I think we should be unapologetic about that, frankly. Um, it, it, you know, in terms of what you're talking about, I think this is incredibly important, and we saw this in DC as well, is as with any school closure, it causes a tremendous amount of disruption. You have to do it in the right way. Some of the best practices that we adopted in DC was when we knew that a school was going to be closed, we notified the families in ample time for them to find a placement or, or uh, engage in the lottery process for the following year. One, we also set up um, structures for them to understand what their choices were. So for those families, we would have school fairs that included both other charter schools as well as the traditional schools that they could go to. And we had to pay special attention to special needs kids because those were the kids who it was hardest to find a, um, an adequate placement for them that was going to, uh, that was gonna be um, effective for those children. And so we kind of had sort of more of a hands-on approach to those families where we did one-on-one -on -one counseling to really make sure that we could put them into a school placement that met, met the needs of their, their uh, children. Question over here. Michelle, in a speech you gave at the Columbia Heights Education Campus in Washington, D.C., you jokingly talked about taking masking tape and taping students' lips to keep them quiet on the way to lunch. And as the crowd laughs, you go on to say that when the students take the tape off, and I quote, their skin is coming off and that they are bleeding. And the crowd still is laughing. If a teacher did that in Kansas City, child services would be called and the teacher would be displaced and possibly terminated. Do you still think that's a funny story? And what would you do if your daughter's teacher taped her mouth shut? So this is, I think, a perfect example of how the um, divisiveness and polarization of the conversation in education reform has gotten out of control. So let me explain my story to you. I was, tell, I was talking to a group of new teachers, and I was telling them, I said, being a new teacher is one of the toughest things that you will ever do. You will find yourself doing and saying things that you never thought. So I told a story about how I, I could never get my kids 
to be quiet as we were walking down to the cafeteria. In fact, when my class walked by, all, oh, you know, everyone was like, oh, there's Ree's class, because they were so sort of rowdy and, and disruptive. So one day when we were walking down to the classroom, I said to the kids, okay, put your fingers over your mouth. Just, just and, and, and keep it there. Don't move it, just like it's a piece of tape. And so one of the kids said, I want a piece of tape to put. So I took a tiny piece of little masking tape and I put it on. And then the other, you know, a couple of other kids said, we want to, you know, so we put it on. And everybody put their fingers on their, you know, uh, lips. And then we walked down and it was the first time that we had walked down quietly. And um, then when we had gotten to the cafeteria, the kids kind of dispersed, and one of the kids was taking the, the, the masking tape that he had put on his own lip uh, there, and he, his lips were dry, and so when he took it off, there, a piece of dry skin fell off, and you know there was a little bit of blood. Um, that has turned into Michelle Ree duct taped the mouths of her students shut. No, and this is serious. This is very serious. This is not, this, this, is, this, this is why the whole kind of villainization and all this kind of stuff has taken a wildly different turn. In a situation like that, what I would expect if somebody noticed or complained or whatever is that it would be investigated, that, that the kids would be questioned, the teacher would be questioned, and if it was a, something like this, what I'm talking about, then people would understand that. It was not, it was not something where you know somebody was duct taping kids' mouths shut. So that's very different. And to, um, and, and I think that, that the, the place that we've gotten into where these kinds of stories get um, sensationalized to, the, to this point, I think is detrimental to the overall um, moving of this conversation and debate forward. Um, first, Ms. Ree, I would like to say thank you for all your hard work and putting yourself out there personally and professionally and having to deal with these kind of challenges. Um, I am recently getting into trying to see what private citizens, parents and non-parents can do to try and transform some of the kids' lives. And I saw an interview with you on C-SPAN where you discussed the American hesitancy to use private, I'm sorry, tax dollars yeah. for private schools. Yeah. And I was one of those people historically. Yeah. Um, but I like that you compared it to our, that we don't have that hesitancy when it comes to university level. Yeah. So I was wondering if you thought that that was a good um, argument at the court level yeah. or if that argument had already been made at the court level. Thank you. Sure. So let me, let me talk about vouchers um, very quickly. Uh, I, I said earlier that I am a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat. Um, and because I have been a lifelong Democrat, um, early on in my education career, I had very clear viewpoints on what education reform should look like and what it shouldn't look like. And where I drew a very bright line was around the idea of vouchers, right? Because Democrats, we don't like vouchers. It takes money away from schools that need it the most, and you know, it's putting a life preserver out to just a handful of kids, and what about the rest of the kids? I bought into all of that. Uh, then I got to Washington, D.C., where they had a publicly funded voucher program in place. And um, during my first year, that, that program was up for reauthorization. And people wanted to know, wanted me to weigh in. Well, what do you think about it? And I knew kind of what my gut reaction was and where my party was. But um, I decided that before I made any proclamations, I was going to talk to people who were involved in the program. And what I found was I was faced with many, many, many parents across the, the city, most of whom were young, single mothers. And these moms had done everything that you would want a mother to do. So they first researched their neighborhood school, found out only 10% of the kids at the school are at grade level proficiency. So my kid has a 90% chance of failure, right? I'm not good enough. Then they would do the next best thing that the district told them to do, which is they would apply through the out-of-boundary lottery process to try to get a spot at a high-performing school on the good side of town, right? And they would inevitably fail because there were thousands of people applying and only a handful of spots available. And then these mothers would come to me and legitimately say, okay, now what do I do? And when I was faced with these moms and the, the, the situations that they were in, and honestly, I could not offer those moms a space for their child at a high-performing district public school. We didn't have enough spaces at our high-performing schools. So then I thought, well, who am I then to deny this lady a voucher, a $7,500 voucher, which was a lot less than what we were spending per kid 
in the public schools to, to potentially send their kid to a Catholic school down the street where they could get a great education. I just was not willing to do that. So I came out in favor of the voucher program. People went nuts, you know? They were like, oh, how could you do this? This is terrible. You know, you're allowing kids to leave the district and they're taking their money with them and all this kind of stuff. I was like, look, my job as the superintendent is not to protect and preserve a system that has been doing wrong by kids. My job is to make sure that every kid in this city gets a great education. I am agnostic <laughs> as to how that happens. And again, I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier, which is for all of the people who are against vouchers, if you are willing to put your child in a failing school, in an ineffective school, then you are allowed to be against vouchers all you want. If you have your child in, a, in an effective school somewhere where they're getting a high quality education, then you can't deny some other mother somewhere else the opportunity for her kid to have the exact same thing. Hi, Michelle. Um, as you know, Kansas City has a few issues with our own schools. What are the top three things you would do to improve the Kansas City schools in the next, say, one year for a dramatic change? <laughs> No, we've been waiting for 40 years. We need a change today. Uh, Thank you. Um, so let me just say there's, there is no silver bullet in all of this. I mean, we have 37 different policies in our policy agenda because of that thing, and it drives me crazy. I get calls from governors and legislators all the time who say, okay, Michelle, I'm gonna have a one big push. I can put one policy through, what should I do to change public education in our state? And I say, that's, that's ridiculous. There is no one thing that you can do that's gonna fix everything. Um, I have, as I told you before, some personal experiences here uh, in Kansas City, and I will say that um, it, when, I was, when I was working with the school district, it was one of the most maddening places. Uh, you just, it was unbelievable how much of a disconnect there was between what the district was doing every day and the needs of the children and the teachers in the schools every day. And I would say the most important thing is what I talked about before, which is, not that this is gonna solve all your problems, but a cultural shift amongst the, the people who are working in the central office of the district to understand that their job is in service of the schools, to so the children, the teachers, and the principals of those schools. That, is, that mindset shift um, is one of the most important things that can happen to make that bureaucracy more effective. I'm the daughter of a public school teacher and librarian, and I spent my childhood watching my mother passionately educating children. She spent long nights grading papers, doing lesson plans, and doing all of those things that make great teachers great. And her passion wasn't money. Her passion was educating children, still is. Yep. So my question is, what makes you think that big cash prizes for test scores are going to attract people with the correct passions to the field of education? So let me say a couple of things. One, um, uh, it's the, the, the compensation that we think um, should be awarded to teachers should go to highly effective teachers. And the way that we measure highly effective teachers is by gains in student achievement, but it's also based on things like classroom observations, et cetera. So just to tie it directly to test scores, I don't think makes sense either. Um, here's the thing, teachers do not go into the profession for money, we all know that. Um, but at the same time, does money make a difference in teachers' lives? Yes, we know this. It, it, you know, if you have a highly effective teacher and they're doing their job every day and they're not being recognized and rewarded and valued the way that they should be, it's, it's very difficult for them to stay in that profession. Um, especially, you know, I, I talk to lots of people who say, I love teaching, um, but you know, I'm about to get married and start a family and I can't afford to continue to be a teacher. Those are the kinds of people that we wanna keep in the classroom, so why? You're looking at me strange, you've never heard that. I, I hear that from teachers a, a lot who say, I would love to continue teaching, but you know, it, it, if I did something else, I could make a whole lot more money and, and that is a, a significant problem. So um, that exists as well. Um, I think at the end of the day, here's, here's the bottom line for me. Um, teachers don't come into teaching, to, to come into to, to the profession for money, but do we as a, society communicate something to our educators, to our children, about how much we value educators based on how much we compensate them? I think we do. 
And I think that needs to change. And I'll give you a specific example. My husband used to be a professional basketball player, played in the NBA. Um, right now, he's obsessed with watching the playoffs. And the other day, we were at home, and I said to him, it is ridiculous to me that these men would be getting paid $12 million a year to dribble a ball around. I said, the best teachers in this country should be making $12 million a year because they are impacting the future of our nation. So does it mean that people are coming into teaching because of money? No, that's not what's motivating them. But we need to, we need to communicate to teachers the value that they have in our society, not alone, but one piece of that can be through their compensation, yes. Hi, my name is Andrea Flinders, and I'm president of the Kansas City Federation of Teachers and School Related Personnel in Kansas City. I first want to say I, we actually agree with much of what you say. We absolutely believe that every child deserves a quality teacher. Um, we believe teachers should be held accountable. Um, we believe that if there's an ineffective teacher in the classroom, that that teacher needs to go and find another type of job. Um, so in those things, I just want you to know we understand that, that we absolutely agree. Where we differ is in how to get there. And I, I hesitate to ask my question because so many times I've heard you before and you have very glib answers. You're very eloquent. You're very passionate when you speak. Um, but my concern basically is why you do not work with the people that work with the kids and why you don't work with the organizations that represent those, those, those um, people. Because I think it's important that, that everyone works together to do what's best for children. And my experience with Students First has been that yes, we have a conversation, and I'm talking about Missouri, Students First in Missouri, but that's as far as it goes. And that when I say to them, well, let's sit down and have a conversation about tenure, or let's sit down and have a conversation about LIFO, they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they turn around and they file legislation that is detrimental to our members, detrimental to the students in the classroom. And, and I, I don't know how, quite how to deal with that because when, when, you know, the union is always getting this horrible name that we protect bad teachers, et cetera, which yeah. we don't. Yeah. Um, so why is it that your organization is so resistant to working with the people that work with our children? So we are not at all resistant to that. In fact, um, you know, if you look at, so, Look, at, for example, at the, the contract w that we put in place in Washington, D.C., right? So this is my own personal experience. We were not allowed to unilaterally impose a contract. We negotiated with the union. They signed the contract. We signed the contract. It was a good contract. In fact, what they said to their members was, it's good for kids, good for teachers. That was their phrase that they used. So I have, an, I have, I have experience in this. We have worked in a number of states. In fact, we just put in place um, a, uh, a piece of legislation in Georgia around teacher evaluation that the Georgia Teachers Association um, supported. Uh, you know, we've done that in a number of states across the country. So we are absolutely willing and able to, to sit down. And, and just to answer your specific question, if you are having trouble here in Missouri, what I would recommend to you is email me directly. Let's have a conversation. Let's sit down. You know, I, it, uh, I can, I can assure you, and, and I think that the, the, the guy who was the teachers union president in DC who's now actually working for Students First will tell you that despite all of the things that you might read, I'm a pretty reasonable person. Um, I, I, I think uh, that, like I said, you know, one of the things that is a, is a misperception or misconception about me is that I'm so, somehow anti-teacher. Nothing could be further than the truth. In fact, I don't think that teachers are the problem in our country's education system. I think that teachers are the solution to the problems that we face. And so I think that teachers being engaged in this conversation is of the utmost importance. In fact, right before I came here, um, I, I spent my uh, afternoon meeting with teachers uh, in, who teach here in Kansas City, kind of hearing their thoughts and views and questions about the education reform movement, I think it's critical. Um, and, and, you know, I can, I'm happy to give you my information afterwards. Uh, and you know, I, I said 10 questions originally, and we're, we're kind of we're running long, it's after eight, so I may restrict this to the next couple of questions on either side. A fair statement. While we live in Kansas City as a retired teacher, and as a substitute, something that California just did about refusing to um, suspend students for a variety of reasons scares the daylights out of me. Um, 
recently, the last few days, we've had situations here where seniors literally break into a building to face it, and the kids get away with maybe not walking, but if someone's with them who's not a member of that particular class, yeah. they could go to jail for breaking and entering. Uh, even my concern is California, what happens in California, will that come across the country? Have you seen that? Yeah, I think what you're referring to is what was adopted recently in uh, the LA Unified School District, which is what they weren't gonna suspend kids anymore for what they were calling willful defiance. Um, here's the bottom line on this, and I think it's an important issue. Um, and again, I think the answer is, is balance. Um, we, we have to understand that we cannot allow children who are chronic behavioral issues to continue to be in the classroom, disrupting the learning environment for other students who are ready to learn, and creating uh, a, a huge problem for the teacher who ends up spending a disproportionate amount of their time on that student, um, therefore forsaking the other kids. It's not okay for us to be communicating to those kids that uh, you can do all this disrespectful and irresponsible things and nothing's gonna happen to you. There have to be specific consequences for those children and they should not have the privilege of, of continuing to um, be in that learning environment where they're being disruptive. On the other side, yes. On the other side of that, though, we cannot abdicate our responsibility for those kids. So we used to do this in DC, like send them home on 20 day suspensions. Like how is that gonna help the child? It's not. What you have to do is create structures and systems so that those kids have the consequence, they're being taken out of the classroom so that they're not disrupting, but we are meeting some of their needs because what we know with disruptive kids is that many of them are disruptive because they actually are frustrated because they don't have the academic skills and that's why they're becoming disruptive. So instead of sending them home for 20 days with a packet, how do we create the interventions that those children need to be able to quickly accelerate their learning? We're going to take one question over here, one question over here, and then the last question over here. Hi. Um, I am not an educator, but I grew up in public school. Um, my mom teaches in public school. She's been in school system, KC School District, for over 30 years. And she's extremely passionate. You know, she won't leave her kids. Um, and um, just sitting here and listening to you, you know, the statistics of um, dropouts and low income, minority based schools mostly, they're startling to me. And um, I kind of wonder why there is that injustice, that imbalance in more private, wealthier schools. And I kind of know why I'm not going to go into that argument though right now, um, just to keep it relevant and simple. Um, what do you think, me as in, I went through, like I've experienced what you're speaking about? It was low income, but I also learned a few foreign languages and you know, and most people don't expect that from a low income public school. You know, so what would you, what can I do as an up and coming concerned citizen to impact you know, education in this country for the younger ones? Yeah. You know, what, what role can I play? So I think that everyday citizens play a huge, huge part in fixing the public education system. We have um, you know, a, a system where most of the laws and policies are created by the legislature, the state legislature, and a lot of the times they're not hearing from people like you who are saying, yes, we need a rigorous teacher evaluation system, yes, we need more choices for parents, yes, we need transparency. Um, and uh, you know, politicians are gonna do what politicians do. They're gonna you know, sort of move towards the people who are you know, constantly communicating with them and putting a lot of pressure on them to take votes in certain directions. And unless people like you are speaking up, then that's not gonna happen. Um, and so let me give you a, a quick example of this. Um, uh, speaking of California, there was recently uh, a situation in, um, in LA where they found that there were a couple of teachers who were um, sexually abusing kids. And um, the, the district actually couldn't fire these teachers. Uh, and so there was a legislator, a state legislator, who had introduced a piece of legislation, and all it would have done was made it possible for districts to fire teachers who were sexual predators. Seems like low hanging fruit, right? Uh, that bill didn't even make it out of committee didn't even make it out of committee, didn't even make it to the Senate floor to people, for people to vote on. 
Uh, and when I tell that story to people in California, they're, they're sort of, I can't believe this, this is, a tr this is a travesty. And I said, but it's actually your fault. I said, because the people who didn't want that law to be in place, they contacted their, their state legislators. They made it clear what they wanted them to do. But all of you, I said, all of you probably don't know who your state assemblyman is. You probably don't know who your state senator is. You certainly don't know whether they sit on the education committee. And you are definitely not tracking what votes they're taking on the education committee. If we are going to hold our public officials accountable, that means that you all are going to have to start understanding what kinds of decisions and public policies those people are putting in place and sending a very clear message that you're not going to vote for them next time unless they're doing things that are in the best interest of kids. Hi, my name is Jamika Kendricks. I am a parent advocate with Kansas City Public Schools. I have a third grader in a failing school, but she is actually reading at a ninth grade level in English and she's bilingual. Um, I wanted to ask a question because what I am experiencing from you today is a huge disconnect from what I know of working with Students First in Missouri. Kind of like Andrea, um, I've talked to um, the, the advocate or the um, lobbyist here. And it seems like when you were in D.C., you had a strong grasp of the importance of understanding the perspective of parents, students, teachers, staff, and all those people who are directly impacted by the decisions about education. However, with Students First, it seems that though you'll listen, that the policies that you guys put forth are most directly or most influenced by business and civic leaders, political folks, and things like that. And so it's very frustrating to me. And so I wanted to know, do you see Students First as being one that, uh, an organization that advocates for policy without actually connecting with those people who are di directly impacted by that policy? <coughs> if not, how do you see it? If so, then why do you think that this would be the best way to put forward policy that actually impacts um, education and barriers to it? So we are a membership organization. We have two million members across the country, and, um, and that is the, the sort of lifeblood of what we do every day is our members. If it was just me going to a state capitol somewhere and telling state legislators I want you to do something it would have no impact whatsoever. What has impact is the fact that we're bringing our members, who are teachers and parents and grandparents and some business owners too, to the Capitol to advocate on behalf of those things. Um, so we absolutely think that's a huge part um, uh, uh, of what we are about. And, um, and you know, we can always improve that, to be honest, right? So part of what we are investing in now here in Missouri is making sure that we have outreach staff who are working with parents uh, in the community so that their voices are being heard in all this, absolutely. Last question. Miss um, Ree, I'm glad to see you. Uh, my name is Amy Cooley and I'm a retired teacher from the Kansas City, Missouri School District. And I do agree with a lot of what you say, especially not getting the resources in the classroom from the central office. I've gone through that many, many, many times. But what I want to ask you today is, uh, you, rep you repeatedly declare that research says that the single most important factor in improving quality of education is teachers. But that's not what the research says. The research actually says that it is only within the school where the teacher is the most important single factor, and that only by 10 to 20 percent is measured in student achievement in the classroom. The research is very clear that up to 66% of success in student achievement is beyond the control of the school. For example, family background and motivation to learn. Why do you continue to misquote the research? First of all, let me be clear, and, uh, and, and I'm very consistent about this. What I say is that of all of the in-school factors that exist, teacher effectiveness and teacher quality is the number one uh, uh, factor that, uh, that impacts student quality, or student, student achievement levels. So I'm, I'm very clear that it is of in-school factors. Um, the reason why I focus on teacher quality and in-school factors is because I used to be a superintendent. What I had purview over and what I had control over was the schools. There were equally competent people who were in charge of social services and the Department of Mental Health who were all doing their jobs too, but what I had to focus on is what I had control over, which is the schools. And if what 
what matters the most in the schools is the teachers, then that's where we should have a huge emphasis. It was interesting to me, I, met, I told you earlier that I was meeting with a group of teachers uh, before this meeting, and we were talking about this topic, and one of them said, are you saying that there are people out there who are saying that, that what teachers do in schools don't matter, that poverty you know, is sort of the, the driving force and that we can't make a difference? He, he, he literally said, like, I can't believe that that's the case. And I said, yeah, actually there are people out there who believe that. So here's the bottom line. Does poverty matter a whole lot? Yes, it does. Does living in abject poverty make it harder for children to come to school every day and to be ready to learn? Unequivocally, yes, it makes it harder. Does it make it harder for the teachers to teach those kids effectively? Yes, it does. But can that be a, an excuse for why we aren't pouring everything that we can into making sure that that child is successful? No, we can't. Because the bottom line is that if we say, if you are poor, we can't really help you in school, sorry, then that's basically saying to kids, if you're born into poverty, sorry, you don't have a chance to live the American dream. You're not going to be able to be successful in life because of the very fact that you are poor. That is so un-American. That is against everything that we stand for as a nation. What we stand for as a nation is the notion that you can be a child coming from any circumstance, any family, whatever the color of your skin, the zip code that you live in, and you can still live the American dream, and you can have a fruitful and productive life because you are getting a high quality education. That's what we stand for as a country. We can never, ever lose that. I want to thank you all for, for being here. I want to thank Andrea Flinders and the members of the Kansas City Federation of Teachers and all uh, current, former, and potential teachers who are in the audience for the great things you do for the civil dialogue that we've had, the passion that's expressed. Uh, we'll continue what we call our What Works in Urban Education series, the library will, including, I hope, with some dialogue with the teachers union. Uh, but tonight, I want to thank one of the great passionate advocates uh, for American education, Michelle Ray. Uh, if you would like a book signed, Michelle will be up here signing, signing books and we'll have a line over here with people who have the books.